Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> Amen. Give those Mary. It's good to see you. It's good to be in the worship center finally. Praise the Lord. Uh, Robin Carter did a fantastic job, Robin, on picking out the colors and all the things. <laughs> Terry been working on the lighting in here and doing all those things. And then Edwin and Terry both been working nonstop getting the sound system back in order. So praise the Lord. Give all these guys who worked so hard along with all the other volunteers a <laughs> praise the Lord. We know that God calls it to rain on the just and the unjust, and praise the Lord, the just had insurance. <laughs> but even better, we have assurance, amen? We have the promise of God. It's been a journey meeting upstairs and doing all that, but praise the Lord. We're just a few more weeks, and we're back in the entire facility on, on the lower stairs. So if you have children in the nursery, be patient, climb the stairs. Hopefully by next Sunday, all that will be taken care of as well. So painters finalized and the cabinet makers finalized and everything is, is back in order. I just praise the Lord the church is not a building, but we are the church. Amen. So say amen. Don't be dead this morning. Ground rule one still remains in order. You can't be dead. We've finished the sermon series. We've been talking about revival matters and the matters of revival. Today I want to kind of sh sh shift gears a little bit because I think it's where we're at as a whole in our fellowship, coming back to, rem to remember God still loves the world. Now I know if you're a skeptic, an agnostic atheist, you're always uh, using this idea that God doesn't love the world or there wouldn't be such crisis and such tragedy and such horrific events that are taking place on every hand. But let me remind you, God still loves the world. All these events that we see us around us have been foretold for centuries. The Bible tells us what the end times are going to be like. But add to that, if you will, the very power and the presence of Satan and sin in this world. However, God's going to deal with that soon as well. So you realize that we're living in a world and all the catastrophes that, that are around us, it seems on every turn and at every hand, you don't put at the feet of God. The devil's still a liar. He still has one aim, one goal, to steal to kill and to destroy. That's his plan for your life, for your family, for our church and for any individual. Lost or saved, that's his goal. He just wants destruction. Why? Because we are created in the very image of God. And so every time the devil looks at you, it just ticks him off. Amen. So get used to the war. You're in a war zone. But praise God, we are the victors in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So I want to talk about God still loves the world. I'd say that not just from the perspective of the crisis and catastrophic days that we're living in, but to also remind you that God still loves the lost world. God still loves people. God still wants to change people's hearts and lives. And we have got to be, as, as, as a church and as the people of God, always remembering the task at hand. That God has called us, still hasn't changed his mind, hasn't changed his prerogatives. His goal is still to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. And I praise God for that. I think the church today, in general, at least in the Western Hemisphere, reminds me of the young man who saw the sign at, at a theater in the mall that they were hiring ushers. Well, needing work, he went in to apply. As he sat down with the interviewer, the interviewer asked him, and just in the job process, and he said, well, well what would you do in case of a fire in the theater? He said, oh, don't worry about me, I'm, I'm fine, I'll be fine. <laughs> That's the casual attitude of the church today all too often. No, don't worry about us. We'll, we'll be fine. Hey, I'm, I'm fine. And I'm going to be fine. My destiny is sealed and settled for eternity. Hallelujah. It's done deal. I'm fine. But I'm not here just to announce the fact that, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I'm good. It's all right with me. But I'm also here as an usher. And so are you. And it's our responsibility as the ushers to be responsible for the whole of the theater. And that theater, theater is still the world. God still loves the world. And he's placed us in this world with responsibility to, be, to, 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 to have the mind and the heart and the passion of God himself for people who are lost and hurting and burdened without Jesus Christ. That's still our responsibility. God still loves the world. Praise God that he wants to use us in regard to that. One of my favorite passages, and I don't say that lightly. I know a lot of times, I say, well, that's one of my favorite verses. One of my favorite verses is found over in Romans chapter 1. If you get cards from me occasionally, boy, that didn't come out in the right print. Can y'all read that? 
All right. <laughs> if y'all get a card for me or a birthday card or something, you always see where I sign by my name. 99% of the time, I put Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And this is part of that, verses 14 and 16, where, you know, the apostles say, listen, I'm a debtor to the Greeks and to the, and to the barbarians. And he makes it very clear. He says, because I'm here for one reason, both to the wise and unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Listen, here's a simple, in a nutshell, Paul's giving three very clear statements about his situation and who he is. He's saying to the folks at Rome, one, I'm a debtor. I, I have this responsibility unto my father. He said, not only am I a debtor, I'm ready. I'm ready to proclaim, to teach, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he makes it very clear, you know, that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All too often, I feel that there are those who are ashamed to the gospel, but he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Three distinct statements. They're very, very important when you realize the scenario and the situation in which they were written. They were written to the church at Rome. Rome is pretty much the center of the world at this point in history and time. Rome is where the persecution is beginning upon the Christians. Rome is the place where the movers and the shakers and the movie makers and all that, they're all there. It's, it's a combination of D.C. and Hollywood, all right? Rome is at that time in that culture. And he's telling them, listen, I'm ready to come to Rome. I'm ready not only to come to Rome, I'm a debtor to Christ to come to Rome, to preach to barbarians and to anybody. I'm not only a debtor and I'm ready, I'm not ashamed. I think there were people who really felt, and many theologians agree, that there were those who felt that Paul would not go to Rome because of the danger that would be involved in getting to Rome, perhaps, or the fact that he might be afraid to go to Rome and he wouldn't go. But he makes it very clear in his letter to the Romans, I'm coming to town. <laughs> And he's under this, if you follow Paul and through his journeys and through his, his adventures as well as the misadventures, you see him moving towards Rome and, and through the book of Acts and, and these other stories that we see throughout the scriptures where it, it, ultimately he's imprisoned to go to Rome. And he willfully, willingly goes to Rome because he wants to stand before Caesar and before the kings. And God puts him before a lot of people in great authority and great power as he makes his journey to Rome. Hey, we're living in a similar time. This is, not a, this is not a friendly environment in America as it used to be when it comes to Christians and to faith in Jesus Christ. It could well be classified and called at one time for you and I to stand in a public square and to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. That was accepted and applauded many times. You say that in the public arena today, and they'll mock you. And they'll come up with every reason to show and to reason why you are a threat to our present culture. Because you're narrow-minded and you're bigoted and you're ignorant if you believe that. Well, just throw me right in there with the rest of them. This is what Paul's saying. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. It's a declaration. It's the way to salvation. It's the way to life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In fact, he makes some clear statements in all these things as he's talking to them. That he's there and he's not ashamed to be and to do what God has called him to be. I think it's down to this. First of all, we have this. He calls himself, he says, I'm a debtor. We have this responsibility. Now, it's not in any way. There's nobody in this room that if you've been given this gift of life through Jesus Christ, that you could ever repay. Amen. All right. There's no way you can repay for what has been paid for in your behalf. And I don't think Paul is trying to say, okay, now I've got to pay for my salvation. Well, so the good thing about heaven is it's, it's, it's not going to be anybody there just telling us how wonderful they are. <laughs> we get enough of that everywhere we go, don't we? Somebody's going to tell you how wonderful they are and how necessary they are. You're going to be able in heaven to walk around and, and if anybody says, hey, how'd you get here? They're not waiting to hear a story about your good works. They're waiting to hear a story about the grace of God. Because nobody gets to heaven but by the grace of God. 
Now, if you ask the average person, pretty much anywhere in the world today, if they believe in a heaven and a hell, majority will agree with you. Ask how to get to heaven, and you come up with some different answers. In fact, the majority of the people, at least in America, don't believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Most feel that you can get to heaven by multitude of paths and roads and avenues, that all faiths all kind of lead to the same location. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. It's not what the Word of God preaches. There's only one way, and it's through Jesus. Jesus Christ. There is no other name among men whereby they must be saved. It's very clear in the scriptures that Jesus is God and he's come as, as, as God in the flesh to offer salvation and to offer, to offer us eternal life. And it's not given to us based on our deserving it, our merit, our talent, our personality, our good looks, our charm, our salesmanship. It's given to us on the basis of grace. And by faith in Jesus Christ, we surrender our hearts in repentance and faith to him, and he gives us this gift of righteousness. We know clearly, especially if you've hung around this church very long at all, that we're all born with a condition called sinner, all right? It's like a blood poison that entered in when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that has certainly poisoned our soul so that now, instead of wanting de and desiring and pursuing God, we want and desire and pursue ourselves in spite of God. We want what we want. We are by nature, the Bible says, children of wrath. We are by nature sinners at heart. All right, we don't, nobody has to teach you how to sin. Did they? There's plenty of examples, by the way, but nobody had to teach you. You were just, you were already well trained, all right? Selfishness comes easy. It's just our nature. The first words out of every baby's mouth are, ah! <laughs> first words they learn are, ma! Let somebody else get something in the house, not ma! <laughs> they want what they want. But only one thing can heal that problem and deliver you from that tainted blood, so to say. And that's the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who came, offered himself as a sacrifice for your sins on the cross. That's the gospel message that we don't deserve sin, uh, that we don't deserve saving, but God saved us in spite of ourselves. Paul did write the Romans in that letter and say, listen, it's just the grace of God. He said, we didn't desire God, we didn't want God, but God came to us. And he brought his grace and his mercy to us who were by nature the children of wrath. So we come and we find grace and we find salvation. So Paul's not trying, don't misunderstand this. He's not saying that I'm going to pay for my salvation. I think it's a completely different, different attitude. And if you look at this word in a, in a biblical uh, lexicon like the Strong's, it's it described a debtor as one who has not yet made amends to the one whom he has injured. Now, we've certainly injured the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. That was our sin at the cross, all of us, that he died for all men's sin. All right. So he's been injured. How do you make amends for that? Well, when you, in your humility, behold in your heart and your, the eye of your mind what Christ has done for you, and you see in your heart and your mind, and the Holy Spirit brings in your heart and mind to life what Christ went through for you, it breeds about humility. It breeds brokenness if we have a sensitive and tender heart to hear what God is saying. And we're, we're disturbed, and we're, we're, we're coming to the place of, of just yieldedness at this point to know we're not right with God, and we begin to be overwhelmed by the fact of how much God loved us. God loved me. God loves the world. So now that I've received this gift of salvation and received this gift of life, my ministry, my service, my commitment's not based on trying to pay back God for anything. It's based on that. I just love Jesus. I just love the Father. I love the Son. I love the Spirit. He's in my life now. And I love God. So we do what we do, not to pay back, because we are certainly indebted, but because we love. What's the song that we sing sometimes? He, he paid the debt he didn't owe, owed a debt I couldn't pay. That's what it really gets down to. <laughs> but you'll never be able to pay it. I don't become if you become the model Christian. <laughs> That's not going to do anything about paying for what's been done for you. You could never pay. It's impossible. The only way to make payment is just spend eternity in hell, and it's never satisfied even there. The debt is. 
but praise God for grace and praise God for the gospel and praise God for Jesus Christ. This is what I want us to come back to as the people of God, to once again remember the beauty of the cross and the beauty of the gospel and the power of the gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God. There is something that happens when you, in humility and faith, begin to share the word of God and speak the word of God to people you know and to family members or perfect strangers. It doesn't matter who it is, but when you speak God's word and the gospel is being spoken, the Holy Spirit of God begins to do a work in the hearts and the minds of people that you may never get to see. You may get to see it one day, but you might never get to see it. But this is the unique working of the Holy Spirit in the heart and the minds of lost people. You know, th this is where we miss it so often. All that we're required to do ultimately in regard to, to being like Paul, to being willing to proclaim, is just to proclaim, just to tell, just to speak. I hear a lot of people talk about, well, we need to be successful evangelists. And it's successful, listen, successful evangelism, successful soul winning, successful witnessing is just telling. Just tell. That's the simplicity of it. The rest of it's God's business. The Holy Spirit comes. But here's what happens. When I tell and I speak the word of God to somebody who doesn't know Christ, that, that Greek word is dunamis, which we get our word dynamite from. You, know, you got to love that, right? So what God, what, what's happening here? Listen, when you're sharing the gospel, it's like throwing verbal hand grenades. <laughs> into the hearts, into the minds. You may not see them go off. You may not hear them go off. But hey, they're going off. Amen. I can't remember how many times that my brother witnessed to me or family members would witness to me or my mother would witness to me about the Lord and I'd just act all stone-faced and stoic, you know, and intelligent. <laughs> but inside I was just screaming, running from God, messed up, empty. Life was chaotic, disorder reigned. But I was all cool and Mr. Composure on the outside. But what was going on the inside? <laughs> some people react negatively. Some people react with no reaction. Some people act positively. But it doesn't matter what they're doing. We know the word of God is dynamite. It's, it's the power of God. And it changes people's hearts and life. And here's what he's saying. I'm just a debtor to, to do that. And, and pretty, pretty simple. I am ready to preach, you know. Let me get past these couple of verses here right quick. I'm ready to preach. The word is, 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 is a Greek word. I'll let you pronounce it yourself, but it means to tell or proclaim good news. It means just to speak the good news. So what's the good news? The gospel message. The man's lost without God, that God loves man. So God sends his son and, to, to, and, and, and he and comes and humbles himself to the cross of Jesus, to the cross and Jesus gives up his self and becomes our sins and now we can have new life in Christ Jesus and he'll forgive us of our sins and he'll make us new and he'll carry us into a life and he'll give us life on the way to eternal life. Eternal life begins at the moment I give my life to Christ. Now this is, this is it's just a simple message. It's a simple message and it's a powerful message. And so Paul said, listen, I'm ready to preach. Well, we're, you know, we're living in a world. It's, it's an amazing to, to hear all the voices that are screaming out and crying out and, and, and all around us in so many different ways. In fact, it was Howard Hendricks, the theologian from Dallas Baptist uh, Theological Seminary. He said, you know, we're living in a world that is crying and screaming out for answers. And all the while the church is stuttering. We don't need to be stuttering. Right. We need to be bro boldly proclaiming. Right. Jesus is Lord. Yes. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. We're not ashamed of that. We're not intimidated about that. And as we do that, God does something supernatural. But please understand, this is what we are all called to. I mean, this is how God has chosen to reach the world. This is what God is doing in the world that we live in. We are called the what? The light and the salt. We're the city set on a hill that cannot be hid. We're the light that sits on a lampstand. It's a candle upon the candlestick, so to say. And it sits there, it says, so that those who are in the house might be able to say. In that Matthew verse, he says, So men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. 
All right. Nor do men light their candle and put it under a bed. Now, I love the symbolism there. I'm sure I've talked about it before, but we learn by repetition. Amen. The symbolism is pretty simple. The bushel. He's talking about, y'all know what a bushel is, you know, Peter Piper picked a peck of pepper peppers. How many peppers did Peter Piper pick? He picked a whole peck of peppers. Well, he picked a bush, bushel full, all right? <laughs> it's a basket full. It says you don't take a basket and put it over the candle. Why? You'll burn your basket up. So what a good way to ruin your basket is put it on, over, over a candle, all right? Or you don't put it under your what? Your bed. It'll ruin your bed. That's not recommended. In fact, it almost sounds like folly if Jesus is just kind of being stupid. Well, Jesus is never stupid. We can be stupid. He's making a clear point. And I think we will pay attention to what we hear. The bushel represents this, the cares of the world, our, our, our daily endeavors. The bed obviously represents, I believe, our, our, our apathetic attitudes sometimes, our slothfulness, our laziness. And that's what kills so much today of the message, isn't it not? We become apathetic, we become cold-hearted, we become spiritually lazy and lethargic, or we get so preoccupied with the world that we're living in. We have business to do, we have places to go, we've got people to meet and things to carry out with. I mean, we've got to do our stuff. And we just get completely, com completely misled. Now, there's going to be beds and bushels that are necessary, but they don't override nor do they overrule nor do they hinder us speaking in fact the bushel becomes my platform for speaking the world I'm in the life I'm living I've got to go to work I've got to go here I have to go get groceries I have to buy gasoline I have to pick this up I have to take my kids this way but now everything changes. It's not about the bushel anymore. It's not about the job anymore. It's not about the kids now. It's not about the gas station. It's about what I'm going to do. Today is now the day the Lord hath made. Today is the day I'm going to glorify God. Today is the day I'm going to surrender to Christ. So I got to go to work, surrender to Christ. But as I go to work, surrender to Christ. As I go to school, surrender to Christ. Now I'm going to school because I got to go to school. And I go to school because I need to make some good grades. And I got to go to work because I have to provide a living. But those now becomes a platform for my lampstand. I'm now going to shine where I'm at. I'm now not going to let those things overrule what God wants to use me for. I'm going to realize now that God's going to use that for his glory in my life. So no matter what the job is, you may hate your job. You start looking at it with a different eye, start beholding it as an opportunity for ministry. You may fall in love with your job. I mean, just think about all the heathens that are there already. Some of you'll get that in a minute. <laughs> it's just a matter of, uh, we get so misaligned and so out of sync and so out of order. But here, this word it, for being ready, it's the word in the, in the Greek language, thumos. It has to do with passion. I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about my love for Christ. I'm passionate because he is the answer. I mean, in a, in, a vo in a world where a million voices are being raised and people pointing a thousand different directions for hope, Jesus is the answer. He still is. I mean, I've, I've watched in, in the same amazement as we've looked into Mexico at the earthquakes and we've looked at the Caribbean and even into Houston and we see the hurricanes and the disaster and the devastation. We look across the seas to Iran and we look at North Korea and all the threats of the wars and the rumors of wars. All these things are happening around us and people are, are looking for hope. But most of them are looking in the wrong way or the wrong place. Some people believe the hope is in their particular political party. Some people believe the hope is in their in economics and in having enough money. Some people believe that hope is going to be found in the government or hope is going to be given to us through the Red Cross or whatever it might be. Now, all those different things might be able to assist you in some necessities of your life in the time of crisis, but none of those will give you what you need. And what you need is a hope that endures. I got some good news. The Bible, God himself calls himself the God of all hope. So the answer is found in our Father. The answer is found in His Word. The answer is found in us living like light that God has called us to be. 
Boy, there's never a time when people listen more closely and more carefully to the gospel than in times like this. This is the time the church ought to be rising like cream to the top of the churn. Amen? Standing out, shining out, speaking out. If we're going to go clean a house, we're going to clean it with a message. If we're going to tear out sheetrock, we'll tear out sheetrock with a message. If we're going to take groceries to somebody, we're going to take them with a message. So wherever we are, whatever we're doing, however we're helping, however we're shining, it all comes back to the light of the glory of the gospel that shines from the face of Christ Jesus and gives hope to a lost world. That's got to be us. And it's got to be us now. Not next week, not next month. Or we just completely, completely miss it. Now, here's what happens. It's things like this. It says, God didn't call me to preach. And I'll make sure that gets fixed next week. We're working with some new systems and stuff. So it'll be a lot bigger print for those of us that are blind like me. But when we say stuff like that, people say, well, Brother Joe, I'd like, to, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to, to share my faith. But or we use that word. I'd like to witness. But God didn't call me. But what, do you all know what witness means? It comes from an old English term. In fact, it was used mostly in Elizabethan time. And it was a word which meant to wit. And it was, to, the way it broke down, the definition of to wit meant to know. Now, a witness was someone who would tell what they know. So you got that? You ever heard the term nitwit? <laughs> How many of y'all heard nitwit before? And my grandkids, what's, with me? what's a nitwit? I mean, well, they're doing it with they didn't know. <laughs> just with the word acting without knowledge, he's just a nitwit. You know, he doesn't know. He doesn't have knowledge. But hey, you shouldn't be able to say that about us. We're not a bunch of nitwits. We're a bunch of wits. <laughs> we know that Jesus is Lord. We know that he's conquered death, hell, and the grave. We know that he's coming again in glory and power soon. We know where we're going to spend eternity. That's what we're ready to share. But if I step back and say, well, you know, it's not really my responsibility. You know, God didn't call me to preach. I love this passage in 2 Corinthians because it's one of those Bible verses that just kind of does away with all the excuses. You know, it says, all things are of God, and God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. R just read it to yourself again, would you, right there? I want you to get, get that down quick. What's he done? God gave us something. Well, he reconciled us, right? And he did it through his son. What's it? It means we've we been brought back to God. We were separated from sin, by sin. Now we've been brought back to God through Jesus Christ. And now God, in the process, gave us eternal life, but he also gave us something else. He gives us this ministry. Say that with me. Ministry. That's not a cuss word. <laughs> All right. Some people in church think that's a cuss word. That's not a cuss word. Ministry is what we've all been called to do. So if we really understand the scriptures properly, we discover that we are all ministers. Now, some people are what we call vocational ministers, but we're all called to be ministers. Now, the next verse is not up there, but uh, uh, let me read it. It says, it's the way it starts in the King James. I'll use these because it makes more sense since I told you about what wit means. He goes on to say, to wit. Now you got it, right? Knowing this. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel. God sent his son Jesus, and God was in the son, and he comes and gives himself for our sins and restores us and, re and reconciles us. And the next verse says it like this. Now then, since all that's true, we are, what's the next word? Ambassadors. Ministers, ambassadors, representatives for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. So this idea that's not my job, uh, that, that doesn't fly any more than this next excuse. You know, it's really, it's, it's Pastor Joe's job. What happened to that? You are the light of the world. Is that only written to pastors? Because if that's true, you're not going to have any fun. <laughs> going to just save it all for me? No, he says, you, that's pretty inclusive, you. So who is you? Well, me is you, all right? And you are you. You're the light of the world. Now, I know I've done this before, but sometimes it's necessary, as I said a while ago, repetition is an important way of learning. Uh, fifth grade science class. 
or sixth grade sex education. Y'all with me still? We're going to go and we're going to give you a little lesson here. When, let's, take, uh, let's take the animal species in the animal world. When dogs procreate, so I don't know what that means, ask your children when you get home. When dogs procreate, the female dog becomes pregnant and she gives birth to what? Little baby dogs. Puppies. Whatever fills your boat. All right? she, gives, she gives birth to dogs. Why? Because she's a dog. When cats procreate, they give birth to what? Little baby cats. Kittens. All right? Let's take it one more. I think you'll have it. When sheep procreate, what do they have? Little baby sheep. Sheep, plural, whatever. Little baby sheep. Little lambs, right? Now, isn't it interesting when the scriptures are being given to us and God's describing his church and how we function, he calls us which of those animals? Sheep. We are the sheep of his pasture. Now, probably of those three animals, the simplest of all is the sheep. I didn't use this illustration. God did, so don't get mad. <laughs> Amen. The simplest of all. Sheep have one responsibility, ultimately, to make more sheep. I've never seen any rancher that I've ever known in the cattle business or whether he's in the sheep business ever tell his sheep and his cows, y'all quit doing that out there in the field. I'm sick of having babies around here. No. The more the merrier, right? Keep making babies. Keep making babies. Keep making babies. The more the merrier. Now, that guy who's running that sheep farm, he's called a what? A shepherd. What does God call pastors? Shepherds. So what is a, now the pastor, yeah, I are, I are sheep too, for lack of better English. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a sheep too. Now, but that means I also bring forth sheep into the world. But we are all to bring forth sheep into the world. The shepherd's responsibility is to feed the sheep and keep them fat and happy. <laughs> Encourage sheep. If they're doing the wrong thing, bring them back. Direct them the right way. Use that rod. Use that staff. Whatever's necessary. Just make sure that the sheep are in the field and they're, and they're together and they're protected and they're being fed well. And then the sheep automatically start getting along with each other. And in the unity, the genuine spiritual unity of the flock... Out of that comes little baby sheep, new believers, people coming to Christ. So in reality, this really isn't the pasture here, is it? Well, maybe for feeding, but not for breeding. <laughs> it's when we take the word, the seed of God's word, and we plant it in the hearts of men by speaking it to other people that sheep are born. Again, remember all that stuff about that sheep, that, that seed bearing fruit? You know, that's in the seeds business. All we just got to do is plant it. I don't have the power to make a seed do something. All I can do is plant it. God's in charge. The life is in the seed, all right? And the life is in the word of God and the life is in the gospel. But I have every responsibility to speak that word of God. Do I not? To share it, to say it, to tell it. And that's when God begins to do a work. I am the light of the world. Another excuse is, well, Brother Joe, you know, I don't really need to speak it because I'm such a good example. Yeah, how's that working for you? <clears throat> if your life is such a good example, point me to someone recently who's come to know Christ because it's just been the way you've lived your life. Amen. Well, they don't know what you're all about until you talk about it. And we have a tendency to talk about the things that we're most passionate about. Isn't that not true? I mean, I won't look today, but I'm sure if I went to your Facebook page, you'd be passionately posting. <laughs> oh, I got a new dress. Oh, my daughter just jumped over the pond. Oh, my car. I just got it washed. Oh, my dog did a trick. You just punch and post and punch and post. Hey, how many times have I told you God didn't let Facebook come into reality for us to post about our dress, but to post about Jesus? This whole world of technology was allowed by the very creator of all things for us as the church to use for his glory. Yeah. And we ought to be interjecting in every way and every means and through every method possible to just share Jesus and preach the gospel and talk about Christ and how good God is. Amen. And But if we miss that, 
Well, hey, your life doesn't say anything. It's important, and I'll talk about that next Sunday in part two of this message, how important it is that our life does speak correctly because it does, our life does need to match what our lips are saying. Amen. You know, as the old saying goes, you know, if you, if you don't walk your talk and zip your lip, it's the same thing. Now, another one is this one, and the common excuse is, is this one, you know, I just don't know how. I just don't know how. I'm so tired of some of these words that keep being introduced, phobia words like homophobic and all that kind of words. But I do believe there's one we could introduce. We can call it evangelophobia. <laughs> evangelophobia. We're afraid to tell anyone around us about Jesus Christ. How many people get like that? How do we let that take root in our soul to start with? When we're literally possessed by the very presence of God, when the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, when Paul just told us that the gospel itself is the power of God and the salvation, in other words, I've got power, I'm holding power, I'm speaking power, what do I need to be afraid of? You ought to be afraid. <laughs> Amen. We have what we need. We've been blessed, endowed, and given what God has given to us. It's a matter of living it in by faith and walking in the fullness of God's Spirit in our life on a daily basis. That'll do away with the I don't know how. Now, here's the good thing about it, such as with our next cell groups and our lift group studies starting today, since you ask free advertisement. <laughs> We're starting Share Jesus Without Fear. All right? How to get over your evangelophobia. <laughs> You don't want to miss this. You say, I don't go to Lyft. Well, you need to start going to Lyft. Amen? Uh, if you don't have any idea, in case you've never understood this, it's my, as your pastor and your shepherd, it's my desire to see every one of you in one of our Bible study groups. Growing, discipling, ministering, being ministered to, encouraging, being encouraged, growing deeper in the Word of God. And not only, it, it, you say, well, I just, it's not about you. Forget about that. It's about the body of Christ. You have a part. You have a gift. We've got to get out of this self mindset in this self world. Amen. And so we're getting together and we're going to be going over about six weeks of just good, solid word of God, insight, information, practical application, things of how to get over this. I don't know how. And you'll discover there that that's really a sorry excuse. Amen. I mean, I thought about this for a little bit. Can you imagine? Remember the woman at the well? And I'm not that old, but I read the story, okay? <laughs> Remember her? She has a run in with Jesus. Her life gets changed, and immediately she runs to town, leaves her water pots to go tell everybody and tell them what just happened. She hadn't gone through a class, she hadn't been through a seminar. In fact, every way and in every mind that can comprehend it, it has been the wrong way of living to that point. She has no background for it, she has no theology lessons, she has no evangelism classes, she has no structured Bible studies going on in her life, but yet she goes and does it anyway. The maniac. That's the proper term in today's culture. The Bible calls him the demoniac. The demoniac of the garrisons or the gatherings, depending on which translation you go by. Here's a guy who's running around buck naked, cutting himself with stones, screaming and howling in the cemetery around the tombstones, runs from people, won't be helped. Nobody can help him at all. He's crazy, like some of you were out of his mind and now Jesus gets on the scene his life is transformed in an instant and now he <laughs> I love it because the Bible says that when the community came out they saw that man clothed and in his right mind maybe some folks need to hear that verse again some of you ladies need to hear that part again being, being clothed in your right mind can I get a witness <laughs> clothed and in his right mind now, what's he doing? Here's the, here's the boat. Here's the water. Here's the land. He comes up the boat. I can see him. Going to get on the boat with Jesus. I'm going with you. And Jesus said, hold on. I, I need to come learn. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the Decapolis, which means the 10 cities that were there and around that area. I want you to go to the Decapolis, and I want you to tell all those people all the great things that the Lord has done for you. I can't do that. Why? I haven't been trained. I, mean, I don't know how. These guys, have been, they've been riding around for two years. Well, they still don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how. Well, what's your excuse? 
And he went and did it. He doesn't have any theological training. He doesn't have any seminars. He can't get on the internet and Google up how to win souls. It's just not available. There's no books that have been written. He can't grab Share Jesus Without Fear on the run. <laughs> Can he? But what's he do? He just goes. This is the way John writes it in the, in the scripture. John put it this way. He said, listen, and this is, the, this is the bottom line. What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've beheld, our hands handled concerning the word of life. Well, that life was manifested and we have seen and we bear witness and we proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us that we have seen what we've seen, what we've heard. We proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship was with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. What's he saying? We're just telling you what we've seen. You know what it means to be lost? Yeah. You know what it means to be saved? Yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. How'd you do that? There's the message. You know who Jesus is? He's the son of God. You know what he did for you? Died on the cross, rose from the dead, coming back in. What more you need? You're equipped. You have the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation. Start throwing grenades. Start launching the missiles. Start speaking the word of God. You know how. You just need to realize it's really, it's not so much in procedures, just go do it. And unfortunately, there are those, and I'll close with this, with, with, with this, is that some people sitting around waiting for the right opportunity. Let me read you this. It says, herald and preach the word of God. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by. Be at hand. Be ready. Whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, whether it be welcome or whether it's unwelcome. You do it anyway. In other words, quit waiting around for your emotions. We don't live by emotions. We live by faith. But yet how often do we walk into a situation knowing God wants us to speak to someone and then we put our little spiritual feeler antennas out, you know, like little ants just trying to sense the atmosphere or whatever. And just waiting for, okay, when it's right, I'll say something. When it's right, I'll speak something. When it's right, I'll, I'll do something. I'll, I'll, I'll start the conversation whenever, when it's favorable. And you kind of go into that scenario and your little antennas come out and there you are waiting. Well, it may never be favorable. The Bible says just do it whether it's not favorable. And certainly, I, I find almost every time I've shared the gospel with somebody, it's not been based on convenience at all. You just do it. It's in your heart. It's just in your heart. Amen. Just take the opportunity. You just speak up. How often do we get the opportunity? Listen, there are so many invitations that people give you every day to share the gospel with them. What do you mean? Here's the way it works. You get to work. Hey, how you doing, Joe? So glad you asked. <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. In fact, I've been doing fantastic since 1973. <laughs> I gave my life to Jesus back in 73. You've got some time, we'll talk about it. <laughs> I mean, it's just all around us. We just, just forget the bushel, the bed, preoccupation. We leave it behind. We don't do what God's called us to do and we miss it. What is successful evangelism? Just sharing just speaking. Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. You know what the modern church has become? Keepers of aquariums. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Not fishers of men. Paul said, you know, it doesn't matter what they think. I'm a fool for Christ. I'm a fool for Christ. I believe it's Caesar, Nero, they called Paul, you know. They, they, they said, you're a fool for Christ. You're an idiot. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. Let me ask you this. What did people name their children? Paul or Nero? <laughs> they don't call him Nero. You might call your dog Nero. <laughs> but not your child. Why? Because we're not fools for Christ. Ready. Forward in spirit. Willing. It's almost this attitude, I just can't wait. I just can't wait. Amen. Convenient or anything, I, I, I can hardly wait. God bring us back to that. And I believe if we'll do as we've been talking about in recent weeks about this whole matter of revival in our heart, where we flip the bushel, 
and kick over the bed and ask God for revival, this comes out of that. But it's a choice. This is what you read clearly in Romans 1. What's he saying? I'm making a choice. I'm coming to Rome. And some of us need to get to Rome. It's dying all around us. God still loves Rome. God still loves the world. And we need to go to them. God never told us to hang a sign and put the time on it. He says, you go bring them in. You compel them to come in. You urge them to come in. And if you're not compelling and urging and bringing, then you're missing the mark. You're the keeper of the aquarium. I don't want to be a keeper of an aquarium. And I don't believe you do. Do you? Are you satisfied with that? I don't want to play religion. I don't want to play at church. I want to be used by God in my life. Amen. That should be every Christian's passion. Yes. Hallelujah. Used by God. Let's stand with our heads bowed for a moment.